It's an exciting time. Um, I'm you know, full-time retina, and um, just at a show of hands, how many of you have sent uh, someone for electrophysiology testing in, say, the last three months? Anybody? Yeah, that's great. Too. That's good. <laughs> yeah, usually it's, it's much rarer than that. I can tell you that's about before we got involved with diopsis, uh, it would be you'd be hard pressed to send somebody for an ERG unless, of course, they had um, you know a, a hereditary macular disease that you're unsure of. Because the experience generally, and I can probably say this universally, is le less than optimal when you send these patients out to these centers. And um, it's it's great to have. Uh, and I was pretty excited of having a system that not only can you do these tests uh, more efficiently, but now you can explore and handle diseases that we never thought of doing electrophysiology for. What I'm going to talk to you about today is on ERG and the diagnosis of uh, uh, retinal disease management. And it's uh, sticking confined to ERG diopsis, as you probably know, makes uh, other testing modalities, um, like the VEP, for example. But I'm going to focus my discussion on uh, the ERG. Uh, these are uh, my disclaimers. Um, I am a consultant, and we are conducting clinical trials um, also on behalf of Diopsis, some pretty exciting clinical trials. We go back to retinal diagnostics, as Matt alluded to earlier. In, in simple terms, how do we assess the retina? Well, there's ophthalmoscopy, both direct and indirect. The next level up, we do fundus photography, you know, with autofluorescence maybe, and then fluorescein or ICG angiography, next level is now with OCT, right? For the last 10, 15 years have been great because we can get these um, cross-sectional um, anatomical uh, data on our retinas. Ultrasonography, we can't forget that. That's also used. And uh, psychophysical testing, like visual fields, has always been in microperimetry. And last but not least is electrophysiology, right? Um, and that has been relegated for a long, long time. So. Before we get to that level, you think simple things. Fundus photograph, it's a subjective test. It's subjective on behalf not of the patient, but of the interpreter. So, you know, you're looking at a choroidal nevus, has it grown from, you know, last year or what have you? It's still subjective. Um, you look at a visual field test, okay, that's subjective on the part of the patient, but it does give you functional data of that retina. So we have, as I mentioned, the OCT, okay. It gives you an objective assessment uh, of the structural data. The only thing, the only thing that gives you an objective functional assessment of the retina is electrodiagnostics or electrophysiology of the retina, right? So what, what are we dealing with in electrophysiology? I'm not going to bore you at this time of the day with the details uh, that you way, remember way back from your residency. But in simple terms, it's a measurement of electrical signals generated by the eye in response to visual stimuli. And that stimuli, oh, sorry. And that stimuli could be either a diffuse light source or a structured light pattern, like, you know, a checkerboard or bars of light and dark. And what, do you, what can we alter when we test? We can alter the intensity of the light. We can alter the duration, the wavelength, and also the spatial location, OK? For example, where is it predominantly uh, applied? This is just a nice schematic to refresh your memory as to where the cellular um, sources, sorry, the cellular sources are uh, of the signals. So if you look at the outer RPE layer, the electrooculogram, that's where the uh, cellular origin of that is. The ERG, as you can see, is the bulk of the retina, right through and through. Pattern ERG is more of the inner kind of ganglion cell layer. And finally, the VEP, which we won't discuss today, is more reflective of the optic nerve uh, functioning. And so, sir. OK. Now, for the purpose of this uh, converse, uh, for this uh, presentation, I'm going to be focusing on the pattern ERG and also the flash ERG. OK? I've got to learn to point it at this thing. There. OK. This, this is an interesting slide. Um, some of you are aware of the advancement that have happened in the gaming industry. Okay, when you think of gaming industry, you know, you think of these guys are playing with their Xbox and what have you. But there's a more sophisticated, where there's feedback into the game. So for example, in, if you look at uh, this uh, first, the second slide, you have these gloves that have sensors that detect the muscle 
activation, like an electromyography. And that influences what the outcome of that game is. So you've got pretty good sophisticated signal processing that's occurring. And similarly, it's also happening uh, with brain waves. Okay? Some of these companies are actually uh, developing systems now that use the brain waves to alter these games. Okay? You know, the gaming industry is very big. So it's interesting that that's not the only area where you see this advance, advancement in signal processing and sensors and so forth. So now we finally have a, 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 the uh, advantage of these things in the medical field, particularly in ophthalmology, particularly in retinal diagnostics, where we're able to reduce the test time. We don't have to have highly trained operators. Um, and we already have a base that is established that Matt uh, alluded to, which is on the lower end, um, and only growing, of uh, data that otherwise we don't have for these disease conditions at a much earlier stage. So just to let you know, this is something important. Any, electro, any electrodiagnostic company um, should be abiding by standards, international standards that have been established for decades by the ISCF, the International Society for Clinical Electrophysiology of Vision. So they are the ones that have established for years what the ERG signals should be, what the frequencies, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, thankfully, Diopsis adheres to that. And that's kind of a, an important thing because you know, you, uh, somebody, Billy Bob, can do some electrodiagnostic in their garage and then you, you're getting data but you can't compare it to other systems you know, or other uh, clinicians. So this is important. So if we look um, at, uh, let me just go back one more here. Okay. Um, this is just a schematic. Uh, which illustrates, okay, the first thing that happens in this whole process, of course, is a light stimulus comes, triggers a rod or cone, and then the next thing, of course, is you get a uh, signal, electrical impulse that's conducted by the ganglion cell layer and obviously modulated throughout the retina and then out through the optic nerve. Now, if we um, look at pattern, Okay, ERG. So now you've got a structured stimulus. Come on. A structured stimulus, and in this case, you have altered white and dark bands. So what is being maintained in this is the luminance is constant, right? So the net bright bar area is the same uh, regardless. And this type of testing, and this is important to remember, is really a test of the inner retina. Okay, so the inner retina and the ganglion cell layer is primarily the area of the retina that is being tested when, uh, with, these, uh, with the pattern ERG. The beauty of the system that Diopsis has developed is the simplicity. So if you, it's basically uh, uh, three electrodes, with a ground electrode and a, and a right eye and a left eye electrode, and they switch from being active to reference depending on which eye is being tested. So it's a very, very simple setup uh, compared to what uh, you and I remember, and these are being nice, is the contact electrodes, right? We know how much patients love to have this on, and also the strings and so forth. So the beauty is, and Diopsis has come out with these external, very patient-friendly uh, electrode uh, that is easy to place, it's easy for the technicians to get consistent results with, and, um, and that's reflected in, in the results. Here's a sample of the printout and showing you basically healthy and dysfunctional uh, pattern ERGs. And you look at the right eye and left eye, and you see this, you have this kind of nice sinusoidal pattern in response to the altering checker uh, uh, or bars. And you, on this set of scale, is the phase. And then there's a bunch of indices here which simplify, they color coded, which is great. Because when you're looking through a lot of these reports, uh, green is good, normal. Yellow is subnormal, borderline, and red is clearly abnormal. And that is reflected here on the, uh, this dysfunctional report right here where you see the sinusoidal patterns are not uh, symmetrical. There's a lag in the phase uh, of these. The beauty is before you had to kind of uh, interpret it like you're fine wine, right? And so uh, there were some indices, of course, but the, the, the folks at Diopsis were really clever at getting indices that are repeatable 
so that when these patients come back, you get a more consistent uh, result. Now, mm, okay, let me, there we are. Okay, so what do the indices mean? We're not going to go into too much of the technical detail, but the simple thing is that there's a magnitude. In other words, how, what is the magnitude of the response of these waves every time they, are, they, they see this pattern changing back and forth? And it's measured at 15 hertz, uh, and that's done to get a more consistent uh, uh, result, so that it's more of a steady state uh, rather than uh, the, it's a, a transient state. The MAGD is an interesting index because what that does, it's a combination of the strength of the signal at 15 hertz and its consistency. And what I uh, and then there's a mag D over magnitude ratio, which is a very handy index. Again, that is a nice uh, indicator or index, if you will, of the overall uh, function and co uh, coherence of the test. And this is the way it's easy to think of it. If you look at a healthy, right? Every time you're flashing these, remember they're sampling 300 waveforms, over 300 waveforms during the 20-second test. Is um, they fire, all the cells fire in synchrony to the same amplitude every time. That's normal. Okay? The same thing with the MAGD is that they're all firing in synchrony, so that ratio, if you divide this ratio by this, it's close to one. That's the normal. So you have, in a sense, a description of the magnitude and the consistency. Now, compare that to if you have dysfunction. And if you just have dysfunction, the, the magnitude, if the cells are firing, not at the same time, but they're hitting the same amplitude, okay, you'll still have this similar waveform. However, on the MAGD, this is the kind of waveform, because you're averaging it at each point, you're going to get a lower waveform. And then when you do the MAGD to MAG ratio, that uh, is a more consistent index and tells you of the abnormality. So this is the things you have to remember with this pattern, is the cells are not only a normal cell fires, they all fire in synchrony to the same level, generate the same signal. Sick or dying cells are going to not only not fire with the same amplitude, they're also not going to fire at the same time. They're going to get delayed. So you have to have a way of how do you uh, quantify that. And this is how we quantify that. Uh, this is a truncated version, actually, of a nice little cheat sheet that they have come up with, which we have in all our lanes. Because, you know, you've got a patient with this disease, what am I going to order? Is it blue, red, flicker? You know, is it blue light restrict? I'm not sure what I'm going to write. But this is handy uh, when you're in busy to um, look at the condition and what would be the best test to give you the information that you need. I'm going to discuss a case, and this is an interesting, uh, there's a few good cases that are, we're going to talk about. Here's a, an example, an 85-year-old male Come complain blurry vision, progressively slow for the last several months. Personal history of uh, hyper systemic hypertension, family history of hypertension. Medication uh, uh, history is not very relevant, and uh, no allergies. Here is the vision uncorrected of both the right and left eye presentation. Best corrected vision is 2030, 2025. IOPs 19 and 21. And nothing exciting in the uh, pupils or anterior segments. The fundus exam shows a cup to disc ratio of about 0.6 in both eyes, but otherwise normal macula and periphery, except there's a splinter hemorrhage on the optic nerve in the fundus exam of the right eye. Here's the visual field of that patient. It's a pretty reliable visual field uh, for the right and left eye, but nothing really jumps out at you as, you know, arcuate defects or any hint of uh, uh, glaucoma. Similar to the nerve, uh, optic nerve analysis, Likewise, does not show anything significantly abnormal. Yes, there's a little bit of prominent cupping. But look at the results here on the contrast sensitivity pattern ERG. Remember, the, uh, I mean, eyeballing the waveforms, they don't look nice and symmetrical like you did in the, saw in the earlier slide. And also the indices are abnormal, okay? The nice thing about this is you can follow these patients. You can follow them. Uh, either before treatment or and during treatment and see which way um, and for the sake of brevity there are very good um, studies that have shown that if you reach the same intraocular pressure with two different medications there are some medications that will alter these tests more significantly than others even though the IOP is down in the safe level 
And so this opens up a whole new area that, uh, you know, for the glaucoma docs to look at as well. So out of, we've known that the pattern ERG is uh, a good indicator of uh, macular function and especially in treatment modalities. And as I illustrated to you also for glaucoma, and we're now going to start looking at also more and more in retina as to with all the anti-VEGFs that we inject, you know, what's happening? What's happening on a functional basis? Uh, and we've known in the retinal world also when the days before anti-VEGFs came on the scene, remember all we had was PDT, you know, the, the, cool, the cold laser? <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, that we've known that a detectable pattern ERG on presentation is a, the single best indicator of improved macular function visual acuity at two years after PDT. So it, it, is, it is increasingly becoming more and more relevant, not only in, oh, di the way we think of electrodiagnostics, I've got a weird retina, please diagnose it and tell me what it is, you know, is it retinitis pigmentosa, what have you. No, now we're monitoring treatment which is exciting. And this is what this slide is designed to illustrate. Uh, not just the pattern, but I'm going to show you something else later on, which is kind of hot off the press with the modalities uh, the diopsis has developed. But they, it allows us to not only see disease progression, but also disease improvement in response to treatment in a functional way. So flash ERG. Okay, flash, a very simple concept, right? So I'm going to hit the retina with a very bright light, okay? saturate everything. It's a real test of the outer retina. Okay, So remember we talked the pattern ERG is uh, more of the inner retina. This is looking at more of the outer retina. And here's an illustration of a typical uh, uh, printout of a fixed luminance flicker. Okay, And yes, you see this kind of you know, response to the flashes okay, of the right and left eye in a healthy patient. The mag face spot is very interesting. This is a good way to eyeball normality. So when you do these tests, yes, you have the indices, okay, uh, as we talked about the magnitude and phase, but this you can think of if all these foxtails, you know, are pointing this lower quadrant and they're very tight, that is a good indicator this is normal, okay, both in the, the magnitude and the phase. You look at this one, okay, what you're noticing here in the left eye, the right eye has a little lower amplitude, the left eye has a bigger amplitude, but look at where this brush, tail brush is. It's, instead of being here, it's shifted. And this one is not only has shifted, okay, but is a little bit more widespread, but it's also attenuated. And that's clearly reflected in these indices. I bring this to attention because really we function by the indices, okay, but the um, good thing is that you can eyeball these reports right away and see, ah, this is abnormal or this is normal. So, at 32 hertz, okay, remember this is going back to your residency, right? At 32 hertz, you remember the cone system can cycle much faster than the rods. The rods kind of kaput. Their strength is in their sensitivity, right, to low, low luminance. So at 32 hertz, when you're flashing that, what you're seeing then is you're getting nice responses, okay? And you got a nice in-face uh, 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 representation. If you do that with the rod system at 32 hertz, what you're going to get is this flat, almost flat line or very low, low cycling, right? So if you have a condition that primarily affects the cones, okay, and wipes them out, and you, you, pre you present them with this flicker, you're going to get kind of a very low flat line on this. <laughs> Come on in, there's still room. <laughs> and here's, here's the exciting thing that it's hot off the press. Is it hot off the press, Matt? Different. <laughs> okay. Fixed luminance, right? So traditionally, you and I, are tr when we look at ERG, remember all those nice little waveforms, that's a standard luminance, big, you know, boom. Well, what happened, and credit to this great doctor here, is what happens if we, instead of just putting a fixed luminance, we start with a low and increase the intensity, okay? Same frequency, still flashing at 32 hertz. But what happens? What you get is this multi-luminance flicker and you get a dose response curve. And this is the amplitude and this is the phase. So you can start to calculate very reliably indices like area under curve. Now, is this the first time it's ever been done? No, but this is now available in an easy form. There's no company, to the best of my knowledge, and correct me if I'm wrong, out there doing this stuff. Okay? There's, there are probably 
you know, somebody in Young Frankenstein down in the lab doing it somewhere and Lord knows where with modifiable, uh, very personalized uh, settings. But this is the beauty is, and, and why this is good is for macular function. We're finding more and more. And when uh, Matt and Alberto came uh, and approached us and said, you know, there's some exciting stuff that we'd like to do. And I thought this would be great for following macular conditions. So we're now just starting to do this. And it's pretty exciting, pretty exciting what we've found. So macular fa uh, function evaluation uh, in eyes with retinopathies is, as I showed you here now with the flicker, you see this nice little response and the very constrained tails. And, uh, and, and you see on the OCT, that's a nice normal response. If you have macular disease, like say macular edema, diabetic macular edema, you will get an attenuation in uh, the signal and also the phase is shifted. So those are the two things just to keep in mind. Remember, sick and dying cells do two things. They don't fire a strong enough signal like their healthy counterparts, and they don't fire on time. Okay? 84-year-old male, blurry vision, progressive, significant for several months, worse in the left eye than in the right. Uh, cardiovascular disease is present in both personal and family history. There's no known allergies. Here's the visual acuity at presentation, 2070, uncorrected, and counting fingers at two feet. The best corrected visual acuity is 2030, 2100. Pressures are reasonable. Uh, no afferent pupillary defect. He had relevant histories at cataract surgery in both eyes. Fundus exam, there's macular drusen in both eyes. Uh, CD ratios are about 0.5, 0.4. But he's got a pigment epithelial detachment that's very prominent here. So I'll show you the visual field. Okay, there's a few little non-specific depressions. Um, in both the right and left eye, okay. And on the uh, nerve fiber layer, there's a few areas of thinning, but again, nothing uh, too, too exciting. Look here at the OCT, okay. For the right and left eye, you've got these, yeah, there's a um, drusen, central drusen, also a pigment epithelial detachment right here, right? So you've got a fibrous pigment epithelial detachment. Look at this. Here you have a fixed luminance flicker. Okay, so boom, 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 hitting, saturating everything, right? And green indices, looks good, right? The tails are pretty well. This one is a little bit shifted. So on the asymmetry comparison, again, we, we don't want to dwell that, but there's a little difference. It's basically telling there's a difference between the right and left eye, okay? And what's interesting, though, is on this multi-luminous flicker, right? You remember where you're increasing the intensity of the stimulus, you're starting to see abnormalities already. And the beauty is we can now monitor so fine, patient comes, and where the strength of these tests is not like the first sitting. First sitting is like a baseline, like your visual fields. You know, when you bring a patient first time to do a visual field, you're not going to hang your hat on it. You bring him back. And this is where the power comes, because then I'm starting to see the delta. Every time they come back, I can see, is this getting better or worse, even before they're symptomatic, or you see anything on OCT or visual acuity. And that's pretty powerful. All right, case three. 72-year-old female, blurry vision in the left eye, thyroid disease, has had LASIK, the, uh, no significant family history or medication uh, issues or allergies. Uncorrected visual acuity is 20, 25, 20, 40. Best corrected is kind of the same. It is the same. No pupillary defects. Again, uh, significant in the anterior segment is uh, cataract surgery in the right, cataract in the left. Okay, So 2 plus NS, 2 plus CS. Normal macular. Uh, and peripheral exam, CD ratios, again, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, the presumptive diagnosis, cataract in the left eye, okay? But you know what? Let me just go back to it. So this is the common scenario that you encounter, we encounter, right? So are we sure that if we go ahead and do the cataract surgery, is the vision going to significantly improve, right? So this is the, the uh, so we do a bunch of things. Right? You send them to a retina and what have you, but if really dense cataracts, and this is, again, a significant, um, you don't know. But look what the tests show. Both the fixed luminance and multiluminance say she wins. So there is a great expectation that after cataract surgery, this patient should have good visual outcome. Okay, so that's another, uh, another feature that uh, can be used. Case four. There's only 60 cases, so we're, we're going good. Um, <laughs> no, no, just kidding. No, it's not. We're, we're coming home. In. Okay, case four. 89-year-old male. Uh, blurry vision in both eyes, worse in the left than the right. 
hypertension, cerebrovascular accident in the family uh, history, uh, no known drug allergies. Here's the presenting vision. 20, 30 counting fingers at one foot. BCVA, not a whole lot different. Pressures are fine. Uh, interesting, um, no APD, cataract surgery in the past. You do the fundus exam, there's prairie papillary atrophy in both eyes, not unusual. Macular drusen and um, fine pigmentary modeling at the macula and periphery. Okay, CD erasures are a reason. So the presumptive diagnosis was macular degeneration in both eyes and an old central retinal artery occlusion. Okay, in the left eye. So you do this test. Okay, you do the visual field test, and you, you get nothing. Okay, it's yeah. There's abnormalities, fine, but you're not getting a sense, uh, and the reliability is kind of you know on, on a vision visual acuity like that is not good, right? So, what do you do? Here, uh, as a, an addition, is a nerve uh, fiber uh, layer OCT, and then the macular OCT. So you see a nice, yeah, there's a few little uh, drews in here and there. The left eye, not that startling, right? You got some outer layer changes, drews in. Yeah, you can say maybe the overall retinal thickness is a little bit smaller, but nothing jumps out at you in this. Right, so they walk in off the street every week in our clinic, and you don't know if they're not a good historian whether they've had a vascular occlusion or not. But take a look at this. So you have already on the fixed luminance flicker, not much asymmetry, right? So um, you have in the phase it's shifted in both eyes. But what's interesting is you look at the multiluminance flicker, okay, particularly the phases, and they're off particularly in that left eye. And you can imagine, this is your only indicator that something really has been going on, okay? Because you look at the fundus, yeah, you may see the, the vessel's a little bit attenuated and what have you, but this is something that, again, first time the patient shows to your office, you don't know, is this getting better, is it getting worse, how long has this been on for? But now you can, sorry, now you can start to quantify this. And I think that's for me personally and for us, it's, it's a powerful tool. In, in, in not only saying, okay, you've got this occlusion, you had a vein occlusion, what have you. Well, fine. Uh, is it getting better? Am I worried about, you know, that this thing is accelerating and, and it could lead to new vascularization? That information we don't have, unless you're doing angi angiograms. And we all know how much fun fluorescein angiograms are. Case five. We're in the home stretch. 72-year-old female, blurry vision, both eyes, worse in the right than the left. History of thyroid disease and retinal detachment in the left eye. Okay, repair. Hypertension, no known allergies. Here's the visual acuity, 2050, 2040, but the BCVA, remember the left eye is the one that had the retinal detachment repair. And it's seeing better, 2025, 2050. Negative APDs, cataract in both eyes, and NS and PSC probably from the bubble that was used. <laughs> uh, normal macula and periphery, and a CD ratio of 0.3 in the right eye. There's minimal pigmentary modeling the macula with laser scars predominantly in chorioretinal atrophic uh, scars at the supertemporal periphery, likely where the retinal tear was and they did the laser. And the CD ratio is uh, 0.4. So the diagnosis is cataract in both eyes and retinal detachment status post repair in the left eye. Okay? Here's the interesting thing. Look at the fixed luminance flicker. Both the fixed luminance uh, uh, flicker shows that the right eye indices are pretty good. The left are borderline. And remember, this is the better seeing eye, but it had a retinal detachment, okay? Similarly, with, with the multiluminance flicker, you see, yeah, there's sub subnormal response in the right eye, but clearly abnormal response in the left eye. And remember, this is a successfully attached retina. So when I see this, I get depressed because you think you fix the retina, everything's back to normal. It never is back to normal. And this is important because, as you know, the longer retina has been detached and we reattach it, uh, the visual outcome, not only centrally, but also globally, is not the same. They always complain, you know what, doc, even with their pseudo-faking, uh, things are not as bright, they're, they're off. And this happens years and years, uh, and it's correlated with the duration of retinal detachment. So it's terrific to be able to have these tools to be able to guide, you know, the how aggressive you are with visually rehabilitating. There comes a point, honestly, where 
you know, this patient is terrific, you know, 2025, you're not going to be pushing. By the same token, you can also monitor deterioration. That's, remember, that's a double-edged sword. Case six, I promise you there's very few left. Seven-year-old female, blurry vision, progressive, significant in both eyes, left worse than right. Diabetic retinopathy and cataracts in her personal history, the referring doc. Uh, hypertension in family history, allergies, no significant uh, allergies. Visual acuity, best corrected 2020, 2200. There's two plus NS. The 2200 eye is the one that had cataract surgery. Uh, negative APDs. The fundus exam shows few hard exudates at the macula and normal periphery. CD ratios within normal limits. Left eye, same thing, but there's some minimal macular edema. Okay? So, here is the visual field and tells you, yeah, you know what? The 2200 is messed up centrally. So, we, we know that. Um, Here's the OCT of the nerve and largely normal. And here is the fixed luminance flicker. And look at this, it's almost like a sunburst. Okay, so you look at the right and left eye. The right, there's a good cohesion, okay, there's, they're not as spread out, but look where the phase is. It's way off, that's why it's red. And this, likewise, is also shifted. The interesting thing, you looked at the multiluminance, you can already see the area under the curve is different between the right and left eye. And this is also reflected in the indices. Okay? So the phase is abnormal in both eyes, but also the, uh, the magnitude is, all, is a more abnormal in the left eye. And that's the one that has uh, the edema. So this is just, again, these are first visits doing these tests. You can monitor and see how they improve over time with this test when everything else uh, it can be the same. For example, you may have a little reduction in OCT, but you don't have a sense. You, we're just being guided anatomically, but not functionally, if you just depend on that. S case 7, 66-year-old female, no complaints in both eyes. Classic, plaquenil use for 13 years. This is a very recent case, actually, we have. And a history of cataracts. Family history, hypertension, and no known allergies, okay? Here's the visual acuity. Okay, and I'll tell you an interesting story because the, the referring uh, doc was very, very concerned about this patient because if you look at the history, right, Plaquenil, full dose for 13 years uninterrupted. And she came in complaining of blurred vision. So we thought, okay. And he's a pretty sharp cookie because uh, he sent her for electrophysiology three years prior to her coming back to him. So it was a three-year gap. She shows up at his doorstep and said, oh, uh, are you not seeing Dr. So-and-so? It was not, it was somebody at the university. And she said, no, he just saw me once and said that, you, you know, to, to come back to you. And I'm sorry I didn't come back to you. But in his referring note, uh, back to the, uh, sorry, the note from the, um, the retina specialist said, you should repeat the multifocal ERG in six months. It didn't happen. So in she comes in, I'm complaining of blurred vision. So, yeah, you say, oh, 2020. Right. Uh, other than one plus NS in both eyes, thankfully the, the macula appeared normal. There was no, you know, bullseye uh, maculopathy or pigment clumping. Uh, CD ratio was fine. So mild NPDR, DME, cataract OD. Okay. Here's her fundus picture. Okay. Pretty reasonable nerves. Thankfully nothing. And I'm sorry, it's not. Um, you can't see, but it's basically normal macular appearance. Here's the OCT, right? So the ellipsoid layer that we look for, remember with plaquenil screening that we all religiously do, is fine in both eyes. You can't call this abnormal. The multifocal ERG report that was done by the university, okay? Here's what they concluded. Produced normal waveform amplitudes and normal implicit time in each eyes. However, the ring ratio so showed a relative decrease. And, and he basically said that she needs to be retested in six months, but the ball was dropped. Okay, the, instead of scheduling the appointment, he thought the referring doc was going to do it. Look what you see here. Here's the concentric stimulus, right? You see this red abnormality in both. Remember, this is a 2020 eye, both eyes. Right? No pigmentary alterations, nothing. Walk in, you know, if she didn't tell you she had plaquenil, you said, oh, it's a normal exam. Next.
But anyways, what I wanted to, to, uh, to show is that we're seeing, we're getting a collection between the university and our Virginia practice of these plaquenil cases that are not even uh, what we deem uh, ready to be screened on a regular basis. But you and I, in two, three years, already are showing some interesting changes electrophysiologically. Now, does that mean that you know, we, we got to stop? This lady, we stopped. We told her, do not take the plaquenil now. And we got on the phone and called her rheumatologist, said, fine, we'll make some arrangements and so forth. But all of us have seen patients who, unfortunately, it's rare, but who have burnt their maculas because they are continuing on the plaquenil. And the doc's saying, well, it doesn't look too bad. And you know and I know that this stuff is stored in our, in our lipid, in our fatty tissues, and is secreted over months after it's terminated. So this is where it, it is a game changer. It really is important. And I'll tell you honestly, we, we do the OCTs, but we're doing every, every single uh, plaquenil uh, patient gets these uh, testing parameters now. And we do a baseline as soon as they, we get them. So somebody with S, uh, lupus who's going to be started on plaquenil, we get a baseline. Because the system is so sensitive, you don't know what else may have happened. They had a trauma a long time ago. So you have to have a baseline to compare to.